Привет! Сегодня мы обсуждаем. Salutations! Today we are discussing Australia versus Indonesia. Just what sort of damage could these two vast countries do to each other? Navies would definitely come into play here. Australian Navy has more advanced systems and larger vessels. But Indonesia's combat fleet is much bigger in numbers. Primarily oriented for defensive coastal warfare, Indonesian Navy would find it hard to support an attack on Australia. But it could try. Using its numbers, it could seek to disperse its fleet over a large area, making it harder for Australia to engage them all in a short time span. Or it could try and use its air force to provide cover, as the distances to northern parts of Australia are within the reach of its planes. Such a fleet would quickly run into opposition. First the human intelligence would warn of preparatory work for the invasion. Then the Australian over-the-horizon radar network would pick up such a fleet. Then a multitude of advanced long-range airborne radar platforms would pinpoint Indonesian ships. If it was just the two naval fleets fighting it out, Indonesians might even have a chance, with more ships and fairly modern anti-ship capabilities. Australian submarines would wreak havoc, but would not be able to deal with all the intruders in time. Australian surface fleet might be decimated if trying to press head-on. But realistically, such an engagement would be decided by air power. Even if Indonesia would rotate all the planes it has for fighter cover, it wouldn't be enough. Their cover range would dictate the landing area. Since no plane can be used 24-7, Indonesia could count on no more than a quarter of its planes available on patrol for the first days of invasion. The ratio would further drop in coming days. While Australia has no long-reach ground-based SAMs, its radar network and AVAX would mean any incoming planes would be tracked well in advance. Australia too would have to rotate its planes on intercept missions, but shorter distances and ample in-air refueling capability would mean dozens of Australian planes could oppose the attackers at any time. Indonesia has no AVAC support and would rely on ships for early warning. Also, no long-reach SAM support from the ships would mean the less advanced Indonesian air fleet would be wiped out by the more numerous Australians with but a few losses. If the Indonesian assault fleet somehow manages to reach the land intact, quite a few troops could be disembarked as their assault fleet is actually quite large. Indonesia does possess sizable naval infantry forces. Yet those forces would find themselves in the middle of nowhere and would very quickly be cut off from all supply runs as Australia's air forces would sink the Indonesian navy and prevent any airdrops. Australian army could then just sit and wait for enemy surrender, as the Indonesian force would have no supply train to support any long-term combat ops. Indonesia would, in reality, stick to its coasts and avoid attacks on Australia. But what sort of success could Australia have in invading Indonesia? Human intelligence would warn of possible incoming naval fleet, but some airstrikes could be pulled off without much warning. Australian planes supported by AVAX and using standoff weapons could hit fixed targets with impunity. Indonesia lacks long-reach SAMs. It knows its older fighters can't go head-to-head -head with enemy's air force. It could try to relocate its fighters so most of them escape Australian initial attacks. Australia has a rather small inventory of tactical cruise missiles, so it would quickly resort to using bombs, which puts their planes in greater danger. Indonesia, while lacking AWACS, does have some hilly islands, offering a decent playground for relocatable ground-based radars. Some warning would be had on some of the Australian strike sorties. While Australia could, using in-air refueling, reach even the faraway fixed targets across Indonesia, such long-range missions would mean less planes available for supporting the Navy and protecting the homeland. It is likely Australia would still concentrate on parts of Indonesia that are closer and not risk deep strikes. It could then hope to force high loss ratio on possible Indonesian intercepts. With fewer planes, Indonesia would only seldomly pick a fight, when a rare opportunity arises to intercept outnumbered Australian assets. Just bombing away would give Australia a slight edge, but would otherwise deal little permanent damage. Australian Air Force and their guided bomb stocks are too small, while numbers of targets across Indonesia are too high. 
to go for a more damaging victory, Australia would have to take Indonesia's islands. Australian Navy actually has a decent amphibious assault fleet, and its Air Force features many transport assets. But Australia lacks many trained troops for amphibious assaults. Most of the troops landed would be just regular army, which is fine if the landing is unopposed. But that may not be the case often. Indonesian ground troops are very numerous and they are likely to be present on all but smallest of islands. Furthermore, in the opening stages of the conflict, before Australia approaches the southern islands, Indonesia would find time to reinforce even the less inhabited islands. When Australia does come in full force, it would have to isolate the islands it wants to attack, which also means very much exposing its navy. Such coastal warfare, enemy hiding amongst many islands and seaways, busy with commercial shipping, is better suited to Indonesian navy and their numerous smaller ships. Some pretty serious losses might ensue for Australia, even if Indonesian naval losses are greater. Australia would also have it harder protecting their own fleet from the air, as time on station far away from Australian air bases would mean only a small portion of their air force could be patrolling over Indonesia at any one time. That would be the perfect opportunity for the Indonesian air force to try and disrupt the Australian invasion. The outcome of many such engagements would still involve Indonesia losing almost all of its air force. But it would cause losses and make Australia choose between protecting its air fleet or naval fleet more. Furthermore, due to the rough terrain on all of those islands, high-tech systems and heavy weapons would be less of an advantage. Number of soldiers and their acclimatization to tropical terrain would favor Indonesians. Disembarked Australian troops might be enough for some of the smaller, distant and less populated islands, but landing them on more important islands would only end in a protracted jungle battle and Australian defeat. Australia would likely choose sparsely inhabited islands with an airstrip for the paratroopers to take it and ensure further supply runs. Islands with tens of thousands of Indonesian troops would be next to impossible to take. Most of the sea and air transport capacity would soon be spent on supporting the existing troops and not bringing in additional ones. Such jungle warfare would also favor light troops, so Indonesian reinforcements wouldn't need to rely as much on their heavy weapons. On larger islands, Indonesians could use their rather heavy and numerous vehicles and fire support. Australians could count on some fire support from the ships, but perhaps their greatest assets would be helicopters. Even so, with such rough terrain, attack helicopters would need to come very close to track enemies, and Indonesia does not lack short-range anti-air systems. Helicopter support would bring many casualties. One area where Indonesia might take Australian land is Christmas Island. It is close enough to be reachable before significant Aussie reinforcements could come. Perhaps even the Cocos Islands could be taken, though probably not held as long. Eventually though, if Australia doesn't seriously go for the southern Indonesian islands and ties most of its assault platforms there, it could be able to liberate both Cocos and Christmas Islands. To sum it up, Indonesia's lack of power projection over enemy territory is weaker than Australia's. Aussies could conquer and hold more of the smaller, less significant islands. So the winner is... Australia! Though the victory would be costly and certainly a minor one. <laughs>